Welcome to this episode of the Australian Navy History podcast series, where we examine important events in the Royal Australian Navy's history. Hello, I'm Professor Rob McLaughlin, former Naval Officer and Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at the University of New South Wales campus at the Australian Defence Force Academy in Canberra. This series is produced by the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales and is supported by the Royal Australian Navy's Sea Power Centre, the Australian Naval Institute the Naval Historical Society of Australia and the Submarine Institute of Australia. In this, the second of two episodes, we will discuss the legal aspects of the Royal Australian Navy's greatest peacetime tragedy, the collision between the aircraft carrier HMAS Melbourne and the destroyer HMAS Voyager. The accident occurred on the night of the 10th of February 1964 off Jarvis Bay, south of Sydney. Of the 314 personnel on board Voyager, 82 died, while the lives of many more were changed forever. The collision resulted in two Royal Commissions, the first and only incident in Australian history to do so, and it had a profound impact on the way that Navy operated in the future and, of course, on the nation. To discuss this tragedy, I'm joined by a distinguished panel. They are Her Honour Judge Sylvia Emmett. She's on the bench of the Federal Circuit Court and is a Naval lawyer herself. Judge Emmett is the daughter of the late Sir Lawrence Street, a former Chief Justice of New South Wales and a Naval lawyer as well. Sir Lawrence was a participant in the legal proceedings following the collision. I'm also joined by Professor Tom Frame, the Director of the Public Leadership Research Group at the Howard Library at University of New South Wales and a former Naval Officer. And he is the author of Where Fate Calls, the most comprehensive account of the Voyager Melbourne collision. Finally, I'm joined today again by Commodore Brian Robertson, whose father, Captain John Robertson, was the Commanding Officer of HMAS Melbourne at the time of the collision. Brian Robertson also commanded five warships, including the Sydney, the Hobart and the Perth, and like his father, served as the Navy's senior captain at sea. Um, Judge Emmett, if I could start with you. The normal course of action after a collision or the grounding of a ship is to convene a board of inquiry, which in turn may lead to one or more courts martial. But what happened in this case? Well, given the loss of 82 lives in what was then Australia's greatest uh, peacetime disaster, the interest in and the profile of the collision led to immense political interest arising really from the um, captivation by the public of the, uh, uh, the issues involved surrounding Navy and surrounding um, the collision. The usual course until this collision would have been the establishment of a board of inquiry by the Chief of Naval Services um, that inquiry would have been more in the nature of an information gathering exercise, um, ensuring that one had the proper expertise and experience um, to gather that information from, um, and arising from that board of inquiry may have been courts martial or other processes. Um, on the, however, on the night of the collision, on the 10th of February 64, 1964, at 2300 hours, the Minister Designate for Navy, Fred Cheney, informed the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department of the collision. And the Secretary said he would inform the Prime Minister immediately. However, the following morning, the Prime Minister realised that the collision was far worse than he had believed, and he expressed the view to his then Attorney General, Sir Garfield Barwick, that Navy might close ranks and attempt a cover-up. There was no particular reason for the Prime Minister to express that view uh, other than the recent um, naval um, disasters that had occurred up to that point, um, in particular the issue in relation to HMAS Tarakan in 1950 and the fallout from uh, that inquiry. Uh, the Prime Minister discussed with Sir Garfield the possibility of a naval court of inquiry headed by a sitting judge. However, at the time that he proposed such a course, he was under the impression that certain regulations had been promulgated to enable that course uh, to happen, whereas in fact they had not happened and it would involve some legislative amendments in order for that uh, Naval Court of Inquiry, Inquiry headed by a sitting judge to be established. However, at the same time, the then Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Beecher, assumed that the usual course of a Naval Board of Inquiry would be established. 
The Prime Minister then met with Admiral Harrington, who was Chief of Naval Staff at the time, and the Attorney General, and the Minister for Navy, Forbes. Um, and that meeting resulted in the Prime Minister's decision that a Royal Commission would conduct the inquiry by way of the appointment of a Judicial Commissioner, Sir John Spicer, who was then Chief Judge of the Industrial Court, who had no military or naval experience. In fact, none of the players had experience with a civil independent Royal Commission run by a judge and involving examination by experienced senior counsel appearing for vested interests. When I say the players, I'm talking about those potentially affected persons such as Captain Robertson, Captain Stevens, the Naval Board, um, Commander uh, and the navigation and officers of the watch on both of the ships. Um, boards of inquiry that had, had been conducted, as I said, by Navy personnel uh, with relevant expertise and experience, um, whereas this was an inquiry by a civilian with no military experience and the participants were those that were being uh, giving evidence were being questioned by senior barristers with varying levels of naval experience, but none of whom were permanent members at the time of the first Royal Commission. So it was an entirely foreign um, process for the naval personnel that were involved in giving evidence at the um, first Royal Commission. Tom Frame, before we go too far, we probably need to introduce some of the key government and naval figures in the story. Could you do that for us? Well, the key government people were the Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, who'd been in the job since 1949 and knew it well. He had noted there'd been a number of incidents and mishaps in the Navy in previous years, and I think you would have to say that his patience, if that's the right way of putting it, his patience with the Navy might slightly have been exhausted by the 10th of February 1964. The incoming Minister for the Navy, I say incoming because they... Uh, the cabinet had to be, the ministry had to be enlarged uh, at that time. And so the incoming minister for the Navy wasn't yet the minister for the Navy. That was Fred Cheney, later Sir Fred Cheney. Uh, he was the minister for the Navy. Um, the other government figures that are significant are Sir Garfield Barwick and Jim Forbes. Garfield Barwick being Attorney General and Jim Forbes being the, the technical minister for the Navy until the legislation was changed to allow the ministry to be expanded for Cheney to be a member. On the naval side, uh, Sir Wilfred Hastings Harrington, or known as Arch, the Chief of Naval Staff, was an important figure. He was the professional head of the Navy. And uh, the Naval Board, uh, consisting of Rear Admirals, men with 30, 40 years experience, um, they initially believed that when something happened within the Navy, it was in their professional purview to do something about it. Uh, and of course, very, very quickly, they learnt that the Prime Minister took the view that this was far bigger than the Navy. The loss of life was such and the public concern was so great that only a Royal Commission uh, was an appropriate way to deal with something of this gravity. Following on from that, Tom, the first Royal Commission was headed by Sir John Spicer. Who was he? The choice of the Royal Commissioner in one sense was not too difficult. Uh, Sir John Spicer uh, was Chief Justice of the Industrial Court. Uh, these kinds of matters generally, maritime matters, came within the purview uh, of his jurisdiction and uh, he was thought to be the suitable person to do it. Although he'd been a member of the Menzies government, uh, no one really accused him of political bias. If they did, it was unfair. Uh, and he was thought to be a man of um, moderate temper, uh, considered, uh, thoughtful, not experienced in naval matters. Uh, no background in collisions at sea, um, but in one sense uh, he represented the public interest. Uh, the public wanted to know why this happened. So Spicer was 
a little bit perhaps dull, if I could say that. He was not a man known for emotional outbursts. Um, he was not thought to be a terrier, uh, the kind of judge who would uh, intervene in cross-examination. That wasn't generally his way. Uh, he was thoughtful. Now, as it turned out, I think some of the matters that were brought before him, I don't think he quite grasped because he didn't have the professional experience, but to some degree he had to rely on counsel assisting. Uh, and Jack Smythe QC uh, was a terrier, was a th force in the land, was known in the Sydney bar for being a, uh, an, an interrogator more than a cross-examiner. And uh, it was his job to make sure the Royal Commission had all the facts adduced to it from which Sir John could make uh, his reason report. So as it was set up, it looked to be OK. Uh, there weren't considerations of political bias. Um, certainly, though, the Navy took the view that why are we doing this? We have the ability, the expertise to inquire into this. So there was tension, if you like, on day one between the government and the Navy, and uh, there were certainly different views about how it should be handled. Now, Judge, Tom's talked a little about Sir John Spicer, the, the Commissioner for the First Royal Commission. Can you describe the conduct of the First Royal Commission? The First Royal Commission sat in Sydney over 55 days. It heard the sworn testimony of 156 witnesses. The First Royal Commission considered in detail the signals sent by Melbourne to Voyager and Voyager's acknowledgements where they were made, um, particularly in the last 30 minutes before the collision. The First Royal Commission heard evidence from various uh, seamen survivors of Voyager, including two that suggested that the signalman, Evans, had said in the water, um, the signalman, I'm sorry, on Voyager, had said in the water that Melbourne didn't turn, Melbourne didn't turn, and Melbourne was supposed to turn to 70 degrees. Uh, the First Royal Commission made no ultimate final finding about uh, whether that was uh, established or not, because at the time, Evans himself could not remember uh, whether he had said those words. However, the Commission also heard evidence from Captain Peake that the final signals from Melbourne to Voyager uh, would not have been misunderstood on the basis of Stephen's competence and especially that the captain of a plane guard destroyer altering course with a carrier um, would watch the carrier constantly himself. So it seemed unbelievable that there could have been a signal misunderstanding leading to that sort of course um, misrepresentation. Subsequently, this, the, the Second Royal Commission concluded that St, uh, Captain Stevens was in fact unfit to command due to health reasons. And each of the counsel referred to above asked questions of many of the witnesses with a view to minimising the exposure of their client. Upon delivery of the report, Captain Robertson believed he'd been dealt with unfairly in that the findings um, suggested that he was in some way partly to blame, as was his navigator and officer of the watch, in failing to challenge or warn Voyager when she was maintaining a port turn towards Melbourne. These findings were also ultimately rejected by the Second Royal Commission. I realise I'm going ahead a little bit, but I think in just explaining the conduct of the First Commission, um, having that future result uh, may well uh, have been uh, relevant. Um, Sir John was to be assisted at the Commission by Mr Jack Smythe QC of Council, also without naval experience. It is usually for the Commissioner and the Council assisting to compile a list of witnesses from whom evidence will be sought and then to determine the order of proceedings and witnesses who may then be um, examined by the other legal representatives on behalf of um, the other interested parties. The Navy was to be represented by Mr Norman Jenkin QC, who believed his brief would also encompass the relevant Melbourne officers, in particular uh, Commander Kelly, the navigator, and Lieutenant Bate, the officer of the watch. 
This was a mistake on the part of both the Navy and Mr Jenkin. The terms of reference included the causes of the collision, the causes of the collision, the circumstances and factors leading up to the collision, the suitability and preparedness of both ships and their equipment, and the rescue and treatment of survivors. The terms of reference were framed by uh, Prime Minister Menzies and Sir Garfield Barwick without consulting Navy. They were broad and geared to meeting public expectation and satisfaction in the scope of transparency of the inquiry process. It should have been apparent to Navy and to, uh, to the Naval Board and to um, Mr Jenkins QC that Navy interests were potentially to be affected by the Royal Commission's inquiry into the suitability and preparedness of both ships. Um, and indeed, uh, Mr Smythe, QC Council Assisting, opened on that very issue. Commander Kelly and Sub-Lieutenant Bate were both potentially affected persons for the purposes of the inquiry, as were Captain Robertson, Captain Stevens and other members of Voyager Company such as the officer of the watch uh, Price on Voyager and the signalman Evans. Um, Captain Robertson chose to represent himself. That mistake became quickly apparent as the unexpected adversarial nature of evidence being led by Mr Smythe in the first instant was directed at establishing blame on the part of Captain Robertson and inadequate procedures and systems by Navy. When I say blame, I say some blame because quite plainly Voyager going across the path of Melbourne um, puts Voyager clearly uh, at fault. Um, this was first uh, carried out by the Fort Royal Commission's first witness, Admiral Beecher, who gave evidence that Voyager's manoeuvre would have or should have caused Captain Robertson sufficient concern to challenge Voyager on radio and by certain blasts. Competent representation of Captain Robertson would have revealed the weakness in that evidence. For example, Admiral Beecher had been on the bridge of Melbourne during a messy manoeuvre by Voyager in Jarvis Bay not long before, but had taken no step, such step to challenge. Also at that point, no evidence had been led as to the circumstances, including signals, courses, times and distances leading up to the collision. I know that my father was very concerned from the outset that Captain Robertson did not have legal representation from the commencement of the inquiry. As counsel for Captain Stevens, uh, my father uh, was duty bound to explore with Captain Robertson by way of essentially cross-examination any exculpatory evidence that may be elicited that may mitigate or exonerate Captain Stevens' part in the collision. I know that my father was very concerned that Captain Robertson perhaps did not fully understand the dimensions of the exploration of his exposure as captain of HMA of uh, Melbourne and the full extent of the type of questions that may be put to Captain Robertson um, in examination by both uh, Mr Smythe and by my father. I do know that my father had immense respect for Captain Robertson and regarded him as a fine man, a fine, a fine naval officer and a man of the utmost integrity. Nevertheless, the ultimate responsibility for all that happens aboard a ship is that of the commanding officer. And as Tom Frame pointed out in his book, responsibility, of course, is different to blame. A personal anecdote, I attended the cross-examination or some of the cross-examination of Captain Robertson as um, an 11-year-old, um, ch a 10-year-old child with my mother and saw part of the cross-examination of Captain Robertson by both my father and by Mr Smythe. Their styles of examination was extremely different. However, by this time, I think that it had become apparent to Captain Robertson the grave error that he had made in not being represented in the first couple of weeks of the inquiry where a lot of uh, critical evidence was led. I remember as a child being 
extremely impressed by the dignity of Captain Robertson and his shining um, integrity, which as I say is something that I know my father always admired immensely. But there was something very sad, even to me as a, as a young girl, about what was taking place for um, in relation to a wonderful man and a wonderful Australian who found himself um, really through no fault of his own to be in a, in a position of having to defend himself uh, both as the captain of the aircraft carrier involved in the collision um, and for the uh, actions that were ultimately found that were taken that were reasonable in all respects. The only other thing I wanted to say about that first Royal Commission was that uh, eventually when uh, Captain Robertson did apply for legal representation, which was some several weeks after the Royal Commission had commenced, commenced I find it astonishing that that request was initially rejected by the Crown Solicitor, um, although ultimately his costs were covered and um, representation was granted to him. But as I said um, earlier, really, by that stage, a lot of the damage to Captain Robertson had been done and there had not been an opportunity to explore the um, flaws in what had been put to him. So, Brian Robertson, can you comment on this first Royal Commission, as Sylvia's talked about, from your father's perspective? Uh, yeah, I think it's um, difficult to follow up on what Sylvia said because uh, so much of that uh, resonates with uh, me, my father and the family, of course. Um, we could say the First Royal Commission really failed. Uh, the, outcome, the outcome was wrong and the processes were suspect, to say the least. Um, it should have been a board of inquiry. Uh, just as my father had the right to expect that Voyager's command team was alert and acting professionally, he also had the right to expect that collision would be examined by a naval board of inquiry where my father's peers, all professional and naval officers, would establish the facts and sit in judgment. This was the way it was done. My father had recently been the president of just such a board. The Royal Commission turned out to be a competition of interests, not the pursuit of truth. For Captain Stevens or for the Navy's reputation to survive, it was clear this would be at the expense of my father's reputation. Uh, my father went to the Commission expecting to be treated fairly. He was confident in the correctness of his ship's actions. And as we've heard, he attended without legal representation. Um, but when he found out that his probity was being attacked, obviously he uh, asked for legal representation and, and we've heard that you know, that was refused. So you, you can't tell me there wasn't some kind of agenda behind the proceedings of this Royal Commission. Um, Smythe's line of questioning was provocative and belligerent. Those are my father's words, by the way. Uh, they were, there were unwarranted accusations uh, there were insinuations, and from the beginning, witnesses were not believed. And my father couldn't understand why he wasn't called first. Instead, Admiral Beecher was asked his opinion. And this was before any evidence had been heard. I'm reminded of the saying that reasoning based on an opinion is the hallmark of the ignorant. Well, there were plenty of opinions or red herrings, or whatever you want to call them. Most of these were proved to be unfounded, and they never appeared in the judge's report. Nevertheless, the damage to my father and the command team in Melbourne had been done, as uh, Sylvia explained. A couple of examples, like uh, the communication between the two ships was faulty, and the naval system was not as good as between aircraft. It took ages to get rid of that red herring. It was suggested that some of the witnesses were not telling the truth, but merely repeating words which they had put in their mouths by my father. Uh, a missing page from a rough notebook used by the officer watch was suggested to be a deliberate destruction of evidence. This was subsequently discounted, but again, damage was done. 
It was suggested Melbourne's radars were faulty, and this was the cause of the collision. Uh, the quartermaster on the wheel in Melbourne at the time made the comment, thank God we were on course when it happened. You'd expect the quartermaster to say something like that. He was attacked for this, and it was suggested it, that he and others in the wheelhouse had in fact been wobbling off course, and he made up this story to protect their own ship. The fact that the navigator and the captain in Melbourne conferred with each other as to what they thought the Voyager was doing in that uh, initial manoeuvre to starboard uh, assumed enormous importance. Every word was analysed and all sorts of meanings attributed to them, except the ones that they both said they meant. So it went on and on like that. In the end, Spicer developed his theory. He found that both ships were turned together to a westerly course, this being some signal corruption of the turn to 020. He had decided that Melbourne had steadied on 020 for a minute, more or less, and that Voyager had steadied, steadied on a westerly course for a minute, more or less, and the vessels then collided. Spicer rejected the evidence of Captain Robertson, Commander Kelly, Sub-Lieutenant Bate, and Chief Yeoman Barker in favour of the reputation of Captain Stevens and the fact that his experience as a destroyer captain meant he could not have made a mistake in taking up station. There is no evidence of bad reception or corrupt signals or even of misunderstood signals. All the speculation concerning a corrupt or incorrectly received signal is based on inferences drawn from the assumption that Captain Stevens could not have made the error he must have made. Spicer was illogical and he was judging the facts to fit his corrupt signal theory. And there is no evidence to support this. Because Spicer thought Voyager was on a steady course for a minute or so, he said Melbourne should have warned Voyager. The failure to give the signal of three short blasts did not, in my opinion, contribute to the disaster, he said but I cannot but feel that such an action would have been taken by a more experienced officer. So in that sentence there, Spicer is pitting the experience of each captain against each other. Stevens could do no wrong because he was in Spicer's view experienced. Yet my father was maligned because Spicer thought he was inexperienced. Wrong. May I remind people that my father had already served extensively in destroyers and had successfully served as the captain of several destroyers, including Vendetta, which was the same class as Voyager. There is no evidence to suggest Voyager was on a steady course prior to the collision. While to the contrary, there is evidence to suggest she was under a steady turn to port, as evidenced by the port lookout and the evidence from the deputy engineer, John Perrot. Both saw the relative bearing go from the port quarter to the port bow. So Spicer got it wrong. Um, he failed to find the true cause of the collision. The findings were based on opinion, not evidence. And we think that um, the command team in Melbourne was judged with hindsight rather than with foresight. Um, there are other aspects as well, I'm sure we could talk about the fact that the Commission, uh, with the order of witnesses um, and some of the witnesses they decided not to take, uh, this all came out in the Second Royal Commission, of course, uh, but you can't convince uh, the Robertson family that there wasn't some kind of political agenda to the conduct of that first Royal Commission. Tom, what's the government and the Navy make of the Commission's findings and recommendations? It's important that we separate out how the government saw the Royal Commission to the Navy. The Navy looked upon it as an opportunity for lessons learned. What had gone wrong? 
what could be addressed so that there was no future occurrence of something as tragic as this. So the Navy outwardly said, oh yes, these are mostly things that we knew, but behind the scenes there are a number of notable reforms. The government, of course, wanted to do two things. First of all, to make the public aware that it was not its responsibility that the collision had occurred, that the government hadn't contributed by matters of policy or procedure to something that had happened at sea. The second thing it wanted to do was reassure the Australian people that there was nothing fundamentally wrong with its Navy and it was able to do its job. So if we pull the two agendas apart, I think we can see that to some degree there was some tension between the government more broadly uh, the Minister for the Navy, the Prime Minister and their job of saying to the Australian people they have a good Navy that's a good investment of taxpayers' funds and the Navy trying to say, well, look, this happened. Uh, it happened not because the Navy was in a period of a decline in peacetime. It was an isolated event. We've understood why it happened. We've initiated a number of reforms. So um, the Navy's view of all of this is different to the government's, although the Navy's part of the government, but the Navy though, I think quietly took the Royal Commission as an opportunity to look at a number of things that were happening and making quiet reforms. Uh, had it have made a lot of noise about the reforms, it might have been an admission of shortcoming and weakness, but it was done quietly. And I think in many ways, the beginning of a period of substantial reform from the second half of 1964, right through I think till the end of 1969. Now, Sylvia, there was an unprecedented second Royal Commission. Why was that? Well, in the first Royal Commission, Captain Stevens cabin hand Barry Highland provided a statement to the first Royal Commission that about 7.25 on 10 February 1964, after he had served an evening meal to the captain in his sea cabin, the captain asked to be brought um, a brandy. Um, Highland's evidence was not tested at the first Royal Commission because it could not be suggested on um, autopsy evidence of Captain Stevens that he was affected by alcohol at the time of the collision, uh, nor was there any evidence from any witness to suggest this was so. Um, Sir John Spicer made no finding whether or not Captain Stevens did in fact call for brandy on the night of the disaster. Um, and in the circumstances, any suggestion that Captain Stevens was under the influence of alcohol being clearly excluded made it understandable that Sir John made no reference to it. Following the report of the First Royal Commission, Captain Robertson and his supporters had strong feelings that adverse findings against Robert, Captain Robertson ought not to have been made and that an injustice had in consequence been done to him. In 1965, uh, Vice Admiral Hickling, a New Zealand uh, naval officer, wrote a book under the title One Minute of Time and Postscript of Voyager. The book was strongly critical of those adverse findings made by the First Royal Commission in respect of Captain Robertson. Information was sought from um, an officer, at least, a, yes, he was an officer cabin, um, by Vice Admiral Hickling for the purpose of his book and ultimately Cabin agreed to provide such information which he taped and expected to remain an undisclosed source. Um, uh, Lieutenant, I think it was Lieutenant Commander Cabin um, had been the annexo on Voyager although not on this particular, uh, at this particular time. Following his provision of the tape uh, Cabin met with Captain Robertson who asked him to sign a statement and to give his permission for a Member of Parliament, Mr John Jess, to show to the Prime Minister and members of Cabinet. So the Cabin statement in fact did not come into existence until five months after the report of the First Royal Commission had been presented. Cabin's statement is by no means confined to Cabin's direct observation at observations and must of it, much of it consists of hearsay and mere impression. Mr John Jess became the champion for Captain Robertson in remedying what he felt to be an injustice done to Captain Robertson by the findings of the first, first Royal Commission. In answer to questions by Justice Asprey, a Royal Commissioner in the Second Royal Commission, 
Cabin said that he had been induced either by Captain Robertson or Mr Jess to lift the ban on the publication of his um, statement to show it to the Prime Minister for the purpose of a more complete story which may justify the reviewing of the collision. Captain Robertson gave evidence that he showed the cabin statement to Mr Jess in an, in an endeavour to have a review of the findings of the First Royal Commission. Cabin did cast doubt on Highland's evidence that he had given Captain Stevens a brandy that night as Cabin remained steadfast in his evidence that Captain Stevens did not drink at sea. And in any event, Harlan had given evidence that Captain Stephen was perfectly normal on the evening in question and, as I said earlier, was not adversely affected by the consumption of liquor. The second Royal Commission um, had terms of reference clearly directed uh, to those issues. Uh, the terms of reference were uh, as follows, whether any of the allegations of Lieutenant Commander Cabin in the document attached, attached to the letters patent, that being the letters that created the Second Royal Commission, regarding the drinking habits and seamanship of Captain Stevens were true, and being true, established that Captain Stevens was unfit to retain command of HMAS Voyager. If it was found um, in answer to question one of the term of reference that Captain Stevens was unfit to retain command, then did the Naval Board know or ought they to have known of such unfitness to retain command and were they at fault in failing to relieve him of command? And then should the findings made in the report by the Royal Commission be varied and if so, in what respect? So Tom, Sylvia's talked about the terms of reference for the second Royal Commission and this Royal Commission was to be headed by three commissioners, Sir Stanley Burberry, Mr Justice Kenneth Asprey and Mr Justice George Lucas. So what were their backgrounds and why the three commissioners? Well, the reason for having three to some degree was it resembled a court of appeal. So Sir John Spicer had, to, had, uh, had a Royal Commission, he'd issued a report and rather than one person making comments on the judgments and findings of another. It was three people, and that's often what happens in a Court of Appeal, although people would say the Second Royal Commission was not a Court of Appeal for the first, the terms of reference were different, but it, it looked a little bit like that, and at the end of that Royal Commission, one would have to say that the three Royal Commissioners in 1967 did stand to some degree in judgment of Spicer's findings and actually uh, suggested that they came to a different set of determinations. Um, the three Royal Commissioners themselves had no particular experience of the Navy, which you could argue was a good thing. They didn't come with any prejudice either for or against the Navy or some preference for a particular individual. They had no involvement in the cases. They were three senior judges unconnected with the Navy, no connections with the government, and they were thought to be competent judicial uh, officers who could look into this, fair-minded. Uh, they were the kind of people too that had looked at in their legal careers accidents, misadventures and things like that. It was also controversial and I think in different ways they were quite three subdued people. Uh, they weren't flamboyant. Asprey certainly was known for very strong views but the three of them I think if you like balanced each other out. They weren't intrusive and the tone of the inquiry, I think, was open to the possibility of finding new things, uh, but not unrestrained in that people could say anything and there'd be lots of publicity. Now, there was that. There was a lot of adverse publicity for the Navy, um, but that certainly wasn't encouraged by the Royal Commissioners, who I think tried to make as much as possible um, the, uh, the hearings very measured uh, to the point. But we need to realise they were dealing with controversial matters, things like um, people taking uh, prescribed medicines, uh, the misuse of alcohol, um, people feeling intimidated and uh, not free to exercise professional judgment. Now, you can only be moderate about those things to some degree, but I actually think that they conducted the Royal Commission in a very fair manner. Thanks, Tom. So, Sylvia, how did that Royal Commission fare? The second Royal Commission made a clear finding that in all the circumstances on that night, Captain Robertson acted reasonably and that to envisage an awareness of the inevitability of the point of no return very many seconds earlier may not have avoided the collision between the ships. As the Second Royal Commission stated, 
It is fundamental to any concept of negligence that in framing his conduct, a man is only bound to anticipate what is reasonably foreseeable in the circumstances. Captain Robertson knew that Voyager was under the control of an experienced captain. There were explanations as to why Voyager was turning starboard and then port, um, as has been mentioned, as to whether or not this was some fishtail um, manoeuvre in order to bring Voyager um, astern. And that by the time the uh, course, the port course set by Voyager um, became apparent to Captain Robertson, it was too late to take any step that would have avoided the collision. Once Captain Robertson realised that the Voyager was not going to veer away in time, that point of no return had been reached and Captain Robertson's immediate duty was, endeavour, was to endeavour by positive means to take avoiding action in the interest of safety of his own ship. This Captain Robertson did by immediately giving the order full astern both engines. The Second Royal Commission found that the true explanation of the reason for the impact between the ships lay in the field of navigation. Captain Robertson was in tactical command of both ships and took Melbourne on a course to which no possible exception could be taken. The Second Royal Commission noted that it is not suggested that Captain Robertson made any error in the actual navigation of Melbourne or in the orders which he caused to be transmitted uh, to Voyager. Ryan Robertson, can you comment on the Second Royal Commission from your father's perspective? Yeah, I, th I think the first point that I'd like to make is by this stage, by the time the Second Royal Commission was convened, uh, my father's career was over. It was ruined. The, uh, the Navy as a result of the First Royal Commission, had posted him ashore, and he took this as an indication that the Navy thought that he was at fault, and he thought that he should have returned to his ship, and as a result, he resigned on a matter of principle. And um, in so doing, he lost his livelihood, he lost his pension, um, and he was left with a family of four young children, um, and it was really quite a big decision to be made by him but he had no qualms in making it. So the Second Royal Commission came along, um, and thankfully, uh, due to the brilliance of Gordon Samuels, um, the commissioners were able to see the errors that Spicer had made and to put all those correct, uh, to correct them all. Um, as a result, my father was given uh, some compensation, but I don't know how you compensate a man who has lost his livelihood and a, and a career of 35 years. Um, the the uh, reparation, I think is probably a better word, uh, was $60,000, which was a lot less than was, that was uh, anticipated by the, the legal team. And it came with a curt letter with no apology. So, Brian, can you, you mentioned uh, Gordon Samuels there. What, what role did he perform in the second Royal Commission? He was representing my father uh, in terms of putting forward um, the arguments against Spice's findings. And he did this um, uh, very well, very cleverly. Uh, he was a brilliant man. And as you may know, he went on to become a governor of New South Wales. So Sylvia, can you tell us a little about them, briefly the findings of the Second Royal Commission? The Second Royal Commission found that the action of Voyager in continually turning to port in the mistaken belief held by the bridge of Voyager until about 20 seconds before the impact that she was on the port of Melbourne. That was consistent with Captain Robertson's theory. The Second Royal Commission found that the mistaken belief of the, on the bridge of Voyager was induced by an error of mental judgment or visual observation the exact cause of which cannot, by reason of the loss in the disaster of Captain Stevens, the navigating officer and the first officer of the watch, now be determined. The Second Royal Commission found that physical conditions relating to the night, the darkened carrier and its appearance during the final changes of course may have contributed to the collision. The Second Royal Commission found that it was impossible to determine either with absolute precision or with sufficient pre precision for complete reliance, the times when signals were dispatched to 
or acknowledged by Voyager, the elapsed times between signals or in which movements were executed, the distances between ships at any given time, or the courses or station of vessels when they were at some considerable distance apart from each other, and the actual speeds of the ships. Um, the second Royal Commission noted that the first Royal Commission did not make a finding in those terms, but found that the reasoning in that report suggested that evidence of that type had been accepted. It should be remembered that the second Royal Commission um, was not there to revisit the navigational findings made by the first Royal Commission, and indeed any evidence that it uh, entertained was only to be directed to those terms of reference to which I have been referred. However, as Captain Robertson said, um, Gordon Samuels persuaded the second Royal Commissioners in argument that uh, these matters should be revisited and alternative findings uh, made. The second Royal Commission made the positive finding that the course pursued by Voyager to the point of collision was not induced by the corruption or misunderstanding of any signal given by Melbourne to Voyager. And this had not been a positive finding made by the first Royal Commission. Um, the second Royal Commission also found that Captain Stevens was an experienced and competent captain of a destroyer and well versed and able to conduct the type of manoeuvre in which Voyager was engaged at the time of collision. However, the Second Royal Commission found that Captain Stevens was not in such a state of health as would find him fit to command a destroyer on such manoeuvres. This finding was contrary um, to the finding of the First Royal Commission, which found that the health of Captain Stevens was such as to enable him properly to exercise that command. Of course, there was none of the evidence um, before the First Royal Commission in relation to Captain Stevens' ill health um, being his duodenal ulcer, uh, which so it is unsurprising that in those circumstances that finding was made. To all intents and purposes, the Second Royal Commission found that the unfitness of Captain Stevens to retain command of Voyager was unknown to the Naval Board. That was one of the terms of reference that the Commission was required to consider. As I've just said, Captain Stevens' unfitness to command was due to duodenal ulcers, which rendered him medically unfit uh, to command. However, there was no direct evidence that this ailment of itself contributed in any way uh, to the collision. Further, the Second Royal Commission specifically rejected any notion that Captain Stevens was under the influence of alcohol at the time of collision or that that had any effect. So, Tom uh, Frame, Sylvia's talked about the, the conclusions of the Second Royal Commission. What did the media make of this Second Royal Commission's findings and recommendations? I think the media, to some degree, reflected ordinary Australian views about what they were hearing, which was that, well, sailors sometimes did drink too much when they were not at sea. Um, there was concern about the fact, though, that Captain Stevens appeared on occasion to drink in excess and perhaps that rendered him incapable of fulfilling all of his duties. I think people were alarmed about that, thought there might have been a little bit more responsibility among those who were deemed to be senior naval officers and in important positions like ship command. There was concern about the possibility there may have been some drug taking, either uh, drugs that we now regard as being recreational drugs like amphetamines, but also that there were prescription drugs, that maybe the Navy and its standards weren't those that the public expected. And there was a divide between the Navy and the nation. The Navy was a small subculture and it did things differently. And when the wider Australian nation heard about this, I think people were surprised. Now, part of it was ignorance that there is a culture of seagoing and most Australians didn't have much experience of it. But there were certain points, I think, where the public said, we want to be assured that the Navy won't either continue to behave in a particular way or certain standards of behaviour will be expected. Now, the Navy outwardly, uh, to some degree, said, well, what Captain Stevens did was a matter for Captain Stevens and we didn't endorse his behaviour and, and it wasn't seen more broadly. But behind the scenes, there were a whole range of things that the Navy did to uh, reflect the findings of the Royal Commission. The media 
tended to lose interest in it pretty quickly. So after 1967, the findings came out. There was money for Captain Robertson. Thought finally there'd been justice. Um, people had thought we've got nearer to the real causes of the collision, perhaps, although it was still largely inexplicable, and that uh, you know life could move on. And the Navy at that time was in uh, combat operations in South Vietnam and it was doing well and the US Navy was congratulating our Navy on how well it was going. So the media, to some degree, after a few weeks, as it always does with a story, loses interest and moves on. The Navy, though, itself decided, as a result of this, that it needed more coordination of its public relations and for the first time had a plan and had people that would help the Navy better sell its message to and its mission to the nation, but also help it in times of crisis to make sure that uh, things that went wrong didn't become PR uh, disasters for the Navy in addition to being tragedies at sea. Thanks, Tom. Brian Robertson, what was the effect of the collision and the two Royal Commissions on your father? Well, I think the first thing to say that he was devastated by the loss of so many lives. Um, today, we've spoken about the maritime and legal implications, but we shouldn't forget the personal loss of 82 men and their families. And also the families of those in HMOs Melbourne. I know some of them, and they still have great difficulty with the way in which they were treated following that collision. Um, we know my father had very high principles, uh, but he was also very philosophical. Uh, he had no regrets. He loved the Navy, but he did what he had to do. Uh, he once told me that if you run into the side of a bus, don't try and push it over, go around it. So after he left the Navy and after the Second Royal Commission, he, he wrote for the Australian newspaper, then he worked for farmers and graziers, and then Dalgetty's uh, large companies, and he was in the personal management area. Uh, regrettably, his uh, marriage failed, so he bought a yacht, he married again, and sailed off to the islands. Unfortunately, he died quite young, uh, aged 64, from brain cancer, which my mother, for one, attributed to the stress. On, on a personal note, Brian, you joined the Navy after the collision. What was the effect of that on you? Well, I joined the Navy uh, in 1966, so just after the collision, um, between the two Royal Commissions. Um, why would I join the Navy? Yeah, good question. And I think the answer is because my father gave me the love of the sea and the Navy. He was very supportive of me joining the Navy, um, and it was a time when he was going through great difficulty, obviously. And, and he did that, I think, because he knew the Navy was much bigger and better than the people who tried to drag him down. Uh, I have been so privileged to be a member of the RAN. It's been a wonderful career. In the early days, as a, a young midshipman, the old salts would say to me, if you're half as good as your old man, you'll be all right. If anything, the uh, history of the collision and the treatment of my father made me more sensitive to the issues of loyalty, particularly loyalty down, not so much up. Um, it probably made me more determined to live up to his reputation. It certainly focused my attention when conducting manoeuvres in close company at night. I can only hope I was half as good as my father. Well, you certainly were. Tom Frame, what was the impact on the Navy of the collision and of the Royal Commissions? I think the collision and the two Royal Commissions were for the Navy a watershed. A watershed in that the Navy could no longer operate on its own, in its own way, with a set of cultural conventions that may have been out of step with the rest of Australia. I think, as never before, the Navy had been looked into by outsiders, and some outsiders had suggested some good things that the Navy might take note of uh, in reforming its culture and some of its procedures. Um, the Navy felt certainly uh, chastened by the whole experience. Uh, it was embarrassing for the Navy. Uh, the good thing, if I can call it a good thing, was that there were operations, combat operations happening at the same time where the Navy was able to say, yes, there have been some problems, we're addressing them, but ships at sea doing what they do, uh, manoeuvring uh, off South Vietnam as part of an international force. They're doing very well. So we can continue to reform and operate at the same time. 
I think to some degree the Navy had um, to much more focus its efforts on recruiting. I um, mean, having a collision and these embarrassing royal commissions, it has an effect on families and young people, uh, fathers and mothers saying, I'm not sure that I want my son to join the Navy. Young people saying, oh, I don't know this is as professional as I thought it was. So the whole thing, I think, made the Navy rethink about itself, about its place in Australian society, uh, and certainly individual officers, as we've heard, both then and later were mindful that uh, pride does become a fall, that hubris when operating at sea is a really volatile commodity and that people need to be humble, they need to realise that uh, training and attentiveness to doctrine and procedures, those kind of things can never be let go. Um, and that whenever you're at sea, um, it's not a high risk situation, but diligence and professional competence need to be on display. And I think any sense of that the Navy's standards might have been declining in the 60s, the, co the collision and the Royal Commissions, I think, changed that attitude around completely. So, Judge Emmett, to turn then to the legal ramifications, what were some of the legal ramifications from this whole affair to Royal Commissions? Well, in my view, probably the most important consequence was the establishment of the uh, naval, naval Legal uh, Panel. The deficiencies in ensuring that representation of particularly potentially affected persons such as Captain Robertson not be routine was plainly uh, wrong. Uh, similarly, the position that the Navy Board had been placed in uh, by being exposed to the findings of a Royal Commission in circumstances where its, its own procedures um, had not been scrutinised in that way uh, before. They did, uh, there was some very useful um, legal advice provided to the Naval Board following the Royal Commission by Commander Wench, who was at that time the equivalent of the Judge Advocate uh, General. And fortunately, the Navy took advantage of that advice and has since become uh, very involved in being cooperative in searching out and addressing any deficiencies in systems um, or procedures that it has control over. However, interestingly, from my own personal point of view, was that at the conclusion of the first Royal Commission, my father was asked to call upon Admiral Harrington, as we said earlier, he was then the Chief of Naval Staff, with a view to putting together a group of lawyers who would constitute a Naval Reserve legal branch. Up until that point, it had been for um, uh, the Crown Solicitor to decide whether or not uh, any persons would be uh, legally represented and those costs uh, be borne by the Commonwealth. The, my father states that he entered Admiral Harrington's office as a retired sub-lieutenant and emerged as a fully fledged commander with the designation of Senior Officer Naval Legal Branch. The, that would happened in 19, later in 1964 after the conclusion of the first Royal Commission. He then became the first of the heads of the legal panel. Um, he was then succeeded by uh, Justice Harold Glass, QC, who served from 1965 to 1973 as panel leader. Then by John Sinclair, who had been junior to my father in uh, representing Captain Stevens in the first Royal Commission. Then the panel was led by the Honourable um, Justice Terence Cole, as he then was from 77 to 88, and then by Justice Murray Tobias from 1988 to 1993. Peter Callaghan, SC, was then panel leader between 93 and 2002. And then in 2002, Justice Slattery, Michael Slattery, took over as panel leader. Justice Slattery is now the Judge Advocate General and um, he was the first head of panel whom I had the honour to serve under. He was followed by Jeff Hilton in 2006, 
Jeff Hilton is a senior counsel who uh, lives principally now overseas. He was then succeeded by Tim Hoyle, senior counsel, um, and then James Rennick, senior counsel, who has served in that role with at least as much distinction as his predecessors and has recently been awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross mm -hmm. in this year's Australia Day Honours. Um, is, the panel is now headed by Commander Felicity Rogers and it is without doubt the jewel in my life that I have had the privilege, as Brian Robertson says, to be able to serve um, in some capacity the Navy. So Brian Robertson, over the years there have been efforts to make amends for uh, the injustices following the collision. Can you comment on these? Yes, the um, Navy has done my father proud. Um, in 2015, through the auspices of the Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Tim Barrett, the Navy named um, the Canberra class, which is those great big new ships we have, the Canberra class through life support facility, which is a very large, brand new building uh, in honour of my father. The building is now called the Captain John Robertson DSC building. And our family is very grateful to Admiral Barrett and the RAN for this honour. Um, my ongoing beef is with our political class. In my view, the fundamental flaw was the convening of a Royal Commission instead of a Board of Inquiry. We've all heard the circus that the first Royal Commission turned out to be. Uh, in 2015, I wrote seeking a political apology to Defence Minister Andrews and subsequently Minister Maurice Payne and Prime Minister Turnbull. I never received an acknowledgement of my letters or a reply. After going through my local member, Mike Kelly, who has got some military background, Maurice Payne finally wrote to me and basically she said that what the Navy had done was enough. This, of course, misses the point. And once again, we see our political leaders ducking for cover. Um, so for now, I'll have to ignore my father's advice and I'll just have to keep on trying to push that bus over. To conclude, can I ask each of you your final thoughts about the Melbourne Voyager collision? Judge Emmett. My final thought really would be that the greatest, to the extent there is any blessing to come out, have come out of this uh, tragic set of circumstances, is that no future a uh, naval officer will be left in the position that Captain Robertson found himself uh, in that um, representation is now imposed on all officers in respect, in respect of whom they may be found to be potentially affected persons in any such inquiry. I do am of the view that the order in which witnesses were called, as both I and Brian Robertson have alluded to, led to the initial perceptions of the roles of Captain Robertson um, insofar as it was suggested there were steps he should have taken. Uh, as stated, these opinions were sought by uh, senior members of Navy far too early in the Royal Commission to have had any, to have had weight or value as they were before a lot of the evidence had been established. The first Royal Commission perhaps stopped a little short of its duty in finding an ultimate um, conclusion, or coming to a conclusion for the cause of the collision. Um, that was its job and whilst uh, perfection may not able, be able to have been achieved, it was possible to come to a, um, a firmer conclusion than perhaps the First Royal Commission did. On the other hand, perhaps that would have been a conclusion that made positive findings about courses Captain Robertson should have taken, such as the potential challenge to Voyager or the blasts. And in the absence of that evidence, having been weakened 
as it should have been by uh, proper uh, cross-examination that may have been ultimately the result of the first Royal Commission had that occurred. So it's very easy with hindsight to go back and say what steps should have been taken. Um, the, o the only comfort I think for all of us is that steps do appear to have been learnt from a procedural point of view. Um, I think that now some of the issues that Brian has raised in relation to the way in which Navy looks after its own um, perhaps no longer applies to those or does, no longer would apply to members of defence. One can never control the political classes and their agendas are always something of a mystery to all of us and they change from time to time and in reaction to particular moments. So I think to pin one's peace of mind on any political outcome um, may, may be a triumph of hope over reality. Brian Robertson, final thoughts from you. <laughs> I agree with Sylvia. Um, however, yeah, my final comment would be that uh, we shouldn't underestimate the ongoing effect this disaster has had on a whole lot of people and their families. Not only the families that lost loved ones, but also the survivors and the ship's company of HMAS Melbourne, who have had to live with unwarranted criticism. Uh, it's my view that a, a government apology would be very well received and set a whole lot of minds at rest. And more importantly, I think it would draw an historical line under the whole saga of the tragedy and its legal aftermath. And finally, Tom Frame, any final thoughts from you? Well, one of the things that we noticed almost immediately after the collision was the Navy didn't have the mechanism and perhaps, perhaps the nation didn't have it either, the mechanism to inquire into an incident like this that was fair to all parties, which got at the truth and which didn't have recrimination uh, as its first motivation. I do think that the legal machinery of the ADF and more broadly the nation was reviewed as a consequence of Voyager. The bit that missed out, I think, though, was what do we do with servicemen and women who are harmed during their service, who think that they've got a claim against the Commonwealth, particularly in a peacetime exercise, and how we handled that. I mean, it wasn't until 1992 that uh, Bernard Verweyen took a case to the High Court, uh, now famously known as Verweyen's case, because the Commonwealth had previously tried to say, well, the statute of limitations, six years, if you hadn't made a claim in that period, you couldn't. It's a complicated case for Wayans, but what it did say was that sometimes when people are harmed in the course of their Defence Force service, some of the uh, some of the effects of that may not be experienced till much later in life. And indeed, how do you deal with anyone who's been harmed in Defence Force service in a way that doesn't add to the injury they feel by the process um, that you offer for dealing with whatever the grievance, whatever the problem, whatever the suffering might be? So eventually the Defence Force Discipline Act replaced the Naval Discipline Act. There was much closer attention to how you might inquire into matters like this where the Navy wasn't immediately made an adversary fighting an outsider who the Navy might have thought was seeking to traduce its reputation. So I do think that legally in terms of uh, Defence Force processes but also the Royal Commissions Act um, Voyager was the cause of that being, I think, reconsidered. Uh, and although it's not exciting and although it happens behind the scenes and although it happened much, much later, it was one of the eventual legacies of Voyager, I think, which takes this terrible tragedy and turns it from being an absolute waste to being something nearer to a sacrifice that because of the lives that were lost, some good things did come of it. And I think if that gives any hope and solace to families, then that's a good thing. Thanks, Tom. Sadly, that's all we have time for. My thanks to Judge Sylvia Emmett, Brian Robertson and Tom Frame. Thank you for joining us. And for more information on the Australian Naval History Podcast Series, simply search for Naval Studies Group on your search engine. Goodbye for now.